you're interested in learning more about the top five questions people ask when they're first researching surrogacy. So let me just dive in with number one. The first question that comes up has to do with insurance and medical bills and expenses. So to answer that question, the way that that works with surrogacy is if the surrogate has her own health insurance, that policy will be reviewed by professionals who work in this industry to see if it is acceptable for surrogate pregnancy. If your insurance policy that you have through your employer or through your spouse or if it's self-funded, that insurance policy will be reviewed and evaluated. And if it's deemed acceptable for surrogacy, the parents will take over the premium costs and they'll also pay for all of the co-pays and deductibles for everything related to the pregnancy and delivery. And the surrogate is not responsible for any of those expenses. That's detailed in the contract and it's fully enforced. So the surrogate will not be left with any medical expenses. She'll also have her insurance for the duration of the pregnancy covered by the intended parents. In the case that the surrogate does not have her own insurance, the parents will purchase a policy for her that is surrogacy friendly, and that will cover her for the duration of the pregnancy and delivery. And once again, she'll not be responsible for any of those medical bills or insurance expenses. The second question that comes up is regarding who has control over your diet. Are the parents going to make you eat organic food or try to make you be vegan or something during your pregnancy? This is a case that is very individual and based on, uh, you know, you and the couple that you match with. So when you're first considering preferences of types of parents that you want to help, if you already eat an organic diet, then you'll probably want to match with parents who would appreciate that and also prefer you to eat an organic diet. If the parents do want you to eat organic only while you're pregnant, they'll often provide an extra allowance to cover the extra costs that go along with eating organic food because it can be a little bit more expensive. Now, if the parents are, um, let's go in an extreme case, if the parents are vegan, are they going to ask their surrogate to eat vegan if she doesn't already do that? No, you will not be matched with a family who eats vegan and wants someone to eat vegan during the pregnancy if you're not already eating vegan. It's just not a reasonable thing to ask. And so nobody is going to put you in a position. Hopefully, uh, if you go with a really good agency, you won't um, be put in a position where you're asked to do something that feels unreasonable or unattainable for you. I know for me personally, when I am in the first few weeks of pregnancy, like I am now, I'm about seven weeks along with my third surrogate baby. And I don't ever have any idea from one minute to the next what I'm gonna wanna eat because I have a lot of food aversions when I'm in these early stages. And sometimes everything's gross. And the only thing I want is a bean and cheese burrito from Taco Bell. So I um, have an intended mother that's very understanding. She was able to carry her own daughter and the only thing she could eat in her pregnancy was Arby's roast beef sandwiches. So she's completely understanding. You'll be matched with parents who are like-minded as far as health and diet and exercise and those expectations. So no, you will not be forced to change your lifestyle um, just as a result of being a surrogate. Just make sure that you match with somebody who's like-minded and understands and accepts the lifestyle that you already lead. That leads me directly into the third most commonly asked question is how is a match determined? Do I get to choose who I match with as a surrogate or do they choose me? And the answer to that question is it is definitely a mutual decision. So the agency that you decide to work with, if you work with a really reputable agency, they're gonna take into careful consideration your preferences, um, your lifestyle, your communication style, and the things that you're hoping to get out of the journey. And they're going to know the parents that they work with that are like-minded. And so they will present you and the parents with each other's profiles of people that they really think that you're likely to get along with. Because by the time you've gotten through the screening process, the agency should have gotten to know you really well and they'll know um, their parents that they serve really well also. And so they'll have an idea of what would be a good match for you. So they'll present you profiles to review and you'll see photos and you'll read the story and the letter ideally from the parents who are um, asking you to for the honor of being their surrogate. And you will decide mutually if you want to meet. And then once you meet, then you'll determine if you wanna move forward with a match. 
and that is something that is done mutually and you will let the case manager or whoever the representative is at the agency know when you've made the decision that yes, you love this couple or this individual and you really want to help them become a parent. So that's definitely going to be something mutual um, and the parents on the other end will feel the same way. Nobody should be ever pushed into a match that they don't feel comfortable with and that they don't feel 100% excited about, um, you know, working together because this is a big journey. It's a big experience and it's really important that you start off right out of the gate with great communication and feeling good about the people that you're helping because you'll be working together for the better part of a year to help a baby come into the world. Question number four that comes up, and uh, sometimes people are very hesitant about asking this because it can feel a little bit yucky talking about money when you're doing something so amazing for someone. But of course, as a surrogate, you are generously compensated for the amazing gift that you're giving. And rightfully so, you 100% deserve a generous compensation for the gift that you're giving. So the way that the compensation works is kind of broken up into two different parts. One part being the base compensation for the pregnancy, which usually starts around thirty-five or forty thousand dollars, depending on where you live, and um, goes up anywhere um, depending on if you're an experienced surrogate, if you have your own insurance, and all these kinds of other factors that go into it. That for a first-time surrogate can go up to maybe fifty or fifty-five thousand. So anywhere from thirty-five to fifty-five thousand, depending on lots of factors, will be the base compensation for the surrogacy. Now that money is broken up typically into nine or 10 monthly installments that start being um, given out to the surrogate after confirmation of heartbeat. So leading up to heartbeat confirmation, before you ever get pregnant as a surrogate, there's a lot of steps that you have to go through. So there's a benefits package on top of that base compensation that kind of helps you um, be reimbursed for the effort and the time that you put in before you even become pregnant. So there will be um, fees, I guess they're oftentimes they're referred to as fees or allowances for things such as starting medications, clearing medical screening, um, and having your embryo transfer, and all of these monthly allowances also that you'll incur. And those vary across the board, depending on the agency that you work with and the state that you live in, and what you need in your kind of personal life. So for instance, if you are a mother of three small children and you require childcare for those children to manage, you know, meeting appointments, you'll have extra reimbursements for childcare. If you don't have young children that require childcare, then you won't require those allowances. So they're kind of um, varied depending on your need. Also, if you are working full time and you have to miss work to make appointments, you'll be reimbursed for your lost wages. So anytime you take time off for an appointment, even before becoming pregnant, you'll always be reimbursed for lost wages. So nobody wants you to be dipping into your own sick time or vacation pay, which is really reserved for your own personal use and for your family. Nobody wants you to be using that for the surrogacy. So you'll always be reimbursed for lost wages, childcare, and then all the other fees and that benefits package over time, kind of on average come somewhere between $8,000 and $10,000 in total. And they also include things like maternity clothing and um, the fee if, you, or if you're required to have a C-section, there's an additional fee for that since that's a surgery. Um, if any other procedures are needed, you'll be compensated for any procedures that you undergo as a result of being a surrogate. So there's lots of things that go into the compensation, but the base compensation is for the pregnancy and that's delivered incrementally over nine or 10 consecutive payments throughout the course of the pregnancy. And at the end, once you deliver, if there's anything left over, that's paid up to you in one lump sum. So that's how compensation works in a nutshell. So the last question, question number five is a big one and it'll take some time for me to dive into a little bit, but I'm going to try to give you a high level overview. The question is, what is the overall process of becoming a surrogate from beginning to end? And so just to give you a little bit of an idea for myself, um, when I first became a surrogate, it was about five years ago. 
and I was teaching at the time. And I decided around March that I knew I had done my research and I was ready to dive in and apply to become a surrogate. So I selected an agency, I submitted my application, and then the next step is to have an interview with someone from that agency over the phone and then to request your medical records. So that process usually takes a week or two. So halfway through March, uh, we had gathered all of my medical records and then I was ready to start my background check and schedule my psychological screening. Every agency kind of does this a little bit differently, but the agency that I went with scheduled the psychological evaluation prior to matching with intended parents. And I think that's wise because sometimes things come up in the psychological evaluation that might determine that you're not a good fit for surrogacy, or maybe it's not the right time in your life, or you don't have the family support that you're going to need. And um, it's better to find those things out before you get any parents' hopes up. Uh, so I went through that process, scheduled my psychological evaluation. My husband attended with me. And then once I had clearance on that end, we had some short, um, quick labs ordered. We went and had blood and urine um, samples collected so they could test us for communicable diseases and drugs, alcohol and tobacco. Um, so they could just make sure that we were just a kind of a general um, medical clearance, not official medical clearance. And um, so that was about from March to April. And then I, um, after I had met those requirements, I had my criminal background check, my psychological screening, my medical records were all evaluated. That whole process took about six weeks. And once that was done, I got to the fun part of receiving profiles of couples that I could potentially be a surrogate for. And that was really fun and also really heartbreaking for me to read through the stories of families who really needed help building their family. And they were such diverse backgrounds. They were from all over the world. I, I got to read profiles of a couple in China, a couple in Dubai, a couple in Sweden, and a couple in Australia, and a couple in Los Angeles. So they was really diverse. I read um, to a couple of some married couples, some traditional, some same-sex couples, and I really just got to see kind of the spread of the reasons why people need help um, from a stranger to build their family. And it was really heartbreaking. I really wanted to help everyone, but I knew that I only had one uterus. And I also really wanted this to be a positive and rewarding experience for me and my family. So ultimately I chose a couple in Australia who I had a lot in common with, with my husband and I, and we were able to meet with them and have a Skype phone call initially around May. So this timeline, uh, I started applied in March. I was able to meet the couple virtually in May. And then shortly after that phone call, we all let the agency know that we absolutely wanted to work together. They were so incredible and kind and warm and I just loved them and couldn't wait to help them. So, I, and my husband felt the same way and he had kind of been a little bit, um, not enthusiastic about it, just kind of going along for the ride up to that point. But once he met them, he was so excited to help them too. So um, that matching process happened from March to May. And then from there, I was able to schedule a medical screening with their IVF doctor. So the doctor who had already created their embryos needed to see me to look at my uterus and do another, um, some more blood panels where they look at specific hormone levels and things like that. And once you go in for that appointment, it takes about two weeks to get the results. So once I had that done, I had official medical clearance after the doctor cleared me. And from there, we were able to go into the legal process. So the parents had their attorney draft up contracts. I had my own attorney, which the parents paid for, that reviewed the contracts with me. We agreed on all of the terms as far as compensation and um, you know what would happen in several worst case scenarios. What were the restrictions I agreed to, like not eating uh, sushi or soft cheeses or hot dogs or, or whatever the case may be. Um, in the contract. And once we settled on that, we got official legal clearance and were able to start IVF medications. So once you have legal clearance, you wait for your next uh, cycle. So we waited for my period to start and then we started the IVF medications. And then I was on the IVF medications for about three weeks before we had embryo transfer. So at this point, it was in July. So I had applied in March 
And by the end of July, I had embryo transfer. And then it takes about two weeks after embryo transfer to determine if you're pregnant. And I fortunately did get pregnant on the first try with two embryos. We did a double embryo transfer and I carried twins for them. And I went on to deliver the twins the following March. So my whole journey the first time from applying to delivering the twins was about a year, which is kind of a fast process. And depending on your circumstances, it can be longer. Um, things can take longer in the screening. For instance, if something were to come up in your medical screening that you needed to work on, maybe there were some vaccines that you needed to get or some vitamin levels that you needed to get up, then those things would take a little bit longer. Um, but on average, I would say the typical journey from application to delivering a healthy baby for the parents and just that whole miracle experience is on average 12 to 18 months in total. And in the end, I decided after first being a surrogate that I definitely wanted to do it again and I've gone on to do it two more times. So um, I definitely think it's an amazing process. Obviously, it can be a little bit um, <laughs> demanding. Um, there are a lot of doctor's appointments that you need to go to in the beginning when you're monitoring the pregnancy early on. There's a lot of ultrasound appointments, way more than you might have experienced in your own pregnancy. And there's a lot of screening and things that have to go into it to make sure you're prepared. So it is kind of a, an, an involved process. It's not just getting pregnant and being pregnant and handing off the baby. You know, there's obviously a lot more that goes into it than you might expect. But in general, in a nutshell, that's the process. And I hope that answers all of your questions. I plan to go more in depth into all of these things because there is so much to it in several webinar sessions. So I hope that you'll join me for those as well.